Cyber attacks against critical infrastructure can have detrimental impacts on everyday life. The past few months, we've seen example after example of cyber attacks causing gas and food shortages, as well as transportation service disruptions. CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, is a standalone U.S. federal agency established to advance the Department of Homeland Security's national security mission. It seeks to reduce and eliminate threats to U.S. critical, physical, and cyber infrastructure. CISA recently confirmed Jen Easterly, a former U.S. Army officer and member of Tailored Access Operations, as its new director. In this episode, special guests Brian McCord and James Carrenti discuss Jen Easterly's confirmation, CISA's mission, and a new catalog of bad practices that the agency is actively developing. Brian McCord has a background in developing cyber capabilities and planning offensive cyber operations for the U.S. military and beyond. He helps bring the hacker mindset to bear as vice president of labs at Shift 5. James Kareni is a Shift 5 co-founder and currently chief architect. He is a former Army cyber officer and is currently focused on bringing advanced technology to operational technology industries. Brian, James, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us on. Yeah. Um, well, yesterday was some pretty big news for... Army cyber alumni across the world. Uh, Jen Easterly, who spent about 20 years in the military and was one of the uh, early pioneers, the OGs of the um, Army Cyber Command. I believe she she commanded the first cyber battalion before uh, before it was cool, and um, uh, was uh, was was instrumental in in standing up some cybersecurity practices at uh, J.P. Morgan. Just got confirmed. Uh, yesterday by the the Senate to lead the uh, CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Um, so it's a really exciting time for us, I think, given her background and her mentality uh, around how to you know defend and and um, and think about cybersecurity for critical infrastructure. Uh, did you guys interact with her at all when you were when 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 you were in? Uh, unfortunately, I, I didn't have uh, uh, the pleasure of meeting her directly, but, you know, it's kind of one of those uh, uh, individuals that uh, you always hear about uh, in the shadows and in the hallways, uh, you know, but such a <laughs> early key founding member of, of organizations that, that we've all been uh, in and around. Yeah, for me personally, I was in our cyber at around the same time, but I was in the sister battalion, so I didn't interact with her directly, but I've met a lot of people who have in the... Uh, Across the board, it's very good things to say. Like, if one thing came across clearly that she was very serious about getting some cyber done, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's Sis's new motto. Actually, is uh, getting cyber done. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I think she has a, a really interesting background that's that's so unique among uh, people that are responsible for defending critical infrastructure because she was at the pointy end of the spear sort of thinking about how how to subvert these systems and getting access to uh, you know missions and things that you know the vast majority of cybersecurity professionals don't don't get to see and i think it's just another example of where us being really good at you know, sort of the red teaming side of things makes you better at um, at, at being able to defend so one of the things that uh, CISA put out recently was a catalog of, of bad practices. So this is kind of an interesting uh, approach to trying to encourage folks to have um, the, the, the right cybersecurity postures. Rather than telling them what to do, you tell them <laughs> what not to do. Um, so I think it's a kind of a cool complement to the sorts of things we, we generally see coming out of agencies. Um, so, uh, James, I know we've been talking about these quite a bit at Shift 5. Um, what were some of the things that CISA put out that uh, that we shouldn't be doing? Yeah, uh, so my understanding is that this is going to be a, like an ongoing and evolving list. So so the, the list of bad practices is actually a little short. Uh, I was kind of surprised the, how short it was to begin. But but the two key ones uh, that, that they have were to um, ensure that you're you're tracking the you know, end-of-life software that, that you're using inside of your both IT and OT um, infrastructure and, and making sure that that you're uh, finding those, identifying those systems, essentially replacing them with kind of modern modern code. Because what happens is, 
you know, um, as things become end of life, there's no more support, there's no more patching. So new vulnerabilities that are found in those systems, there's, there's no one out there on the other end inside of whichever company built it to, to essentially fix those problems. So um, really it would be on that organization to resolve those issues or, or, or find, you know, uh, updates to those processes. And then the other one, which is actually, um, you know, these, these two can kind of really play together in a lot of ways is um, uh, making sure that you're not using default or admin or kind of bad passwords um, and in credentials and in the services on, on the critical infrastructure. Um, you know, these, these two kind of stand out because they're, they're kind of the fundamental problem and kind of two really major uh, hacks that, that we've seen. Um, Wanna cry being like kind of the, the takes advantage of that first, you know, um, end of life support or, or systems that don't have patch anymore, you know, uh, uh, taking advantage of um, some bad processes and, and uh, SMB services um, that, you know, ha have been around and, and um, in, in especially windows, like old windows systems um, and, and patching those, those vulnerabilities there is, is something that, you know, uh, I think Microsoft would encourage you to do. Uh, and then uh, the second one, you know, was uh, Solar Winds that uh, had the had a major uh, system compromise that that and affected the entire supply chain. And and uh, essentially, the organization blamed it on bad password set up by an intern. I feel really bad for that intern. You know, kind of getting completely blamed for for uh, setting something up that they never thought someday would be you know so widely used. But you know, it, it's something. It, those are just kind of. Uh, clear use cases of, of where this can go wrong and how can it, it can have major impacts on critical infrastructure and, and the global supply chain. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right, James. And like, I think, Brian, when we talk about operational technology and fleet assets, some of these problems are so much more acute than on the IT side of things, right? Like for operational technology, we had um, Dave Weinstein on the po on the podcast, who was the former um, CTO and, and Chief Security Officer of New Jersey. You know, he said, "Look, the biggest thing that's driving critical infrastructure operators is is safety and availability. And if 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 you're basically not appealing to those two things, it's it's basically impossible to to drive change. And so, actually, ironically, there's so much trepidation and worry about changing things or upgrading software or making modifications to a system that's working, uh, that you're actually creating cybersecurity problems because you're, you're sort of not updating these things. Right. Right. Yeah. So like to go back a second, think about this in the bigger picture. So CISA was actually stood up in 2018, right? So it's very new. It was stood up by the executive branch to be a risk management framework almost, right? So they self-describe is a risk organization, and they actually cut their teeth when their first emergency directive was issued in 2019, and it was focused on uh, DNS manipulation by an actor they said had a nexus in Iran. That was their public wording for it. And so really from the beginning, there's been a recognition that no one has all their stuff together on cyber, especially at this wide national level. Like, how do we coordinate all these different data points and sensors and things that happen on two individuals from actors, all the way from criminals to, you know, nation states, right, that are doing these things. And um, CISA here is kind of indicating that, look, we've been doing this for a couple of years now. We've trying to really figure out everything that there is to know about cyber for these last two years and looking at all sorts of actors. And these are the two things we keep seeing happening, right? They seem super simple, like, they seem kind of captain obvious, like, no duh, these things are happening, but that's what they keep seeing working. And I feel that in the OT space, you know, there's a lot of similar problems, right? In that, you know, in our experience, we keep seeing the same things happen over and over, either because people don't know, or they don't fully understand the implications, or they just don't care, right? Because they're looking to get revenue, or they're looking to have high availability, uh, for example, like a bad practice I would add to this list from the OT perspective is uh, realize that your security model is based on an air-gapped network. So when you attach a device that connects your interior vehicle or industrial network to another network, you've now added a node to be concerned about, and you need to start thinking about network-level security, not just device security, right? Because people tend to really focus on the device like, hey, 
the OEM has looked at this. They have a cyber team. They claim their device is cyber safe, but they're not looking at where all these things sit in the network. And then they have the same problems at the device level, right? So a lot of these devices, when you actually dig down to it, either they're using admin admin to log into the debug port, right? Or they have some sort of published key that you can find if you just Google it hard enough or you look in the dark web or like... Or it's in the firmware. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you just reverse engineer the firmware a little bit. Yeah. You've got the SSH key that opens up the magic remote terminal, right? Um, in addition, a lot of people that I found in the OT space, they have no recovery plan, right? And so in the IT space, when you're looking at, hey, if my, you know, my IT admin network becomes a victim of ransomware, do I have all the data backed up so I can restore if I need to, right? And that helped us solve even things like the Colonial Pipeline problem eventually because they had enough data backup to get it online over time. But in the OT space, like, they, I just haven't heard a lot of people planning for that, right? And that's one of the a cyber bad practice I would really want to bring to the front is what is your plan for when it goes wrong? Because for a lot of these things, like that day is coming, right? And a lot of people just assume that if something on my vehicle or my industrial platform goes wrong, it's a maintenance issue, right? And so I'll swap out a line replaceable unit or I'll you know patch a cable or do whatever needs to fix and we'll be fine. But what happens if this goes deeper and becomes a cyber issue? I just don't see a lot of recovery planning for that. Yeah, and it's important that you not only have a recovery plan, but that you regularly exercise it, right? It's like the old adage for backups is like, you need to regularly make sure that you're you're actually able to recover your backups, right? Because um, misconfigurations and things like that can cause uh, catastrophes when, when, you're, when you're not regularly checking those things. Brian, you mentioned um, a really interesting technique that was, I love the, the nexus of actors around Iran, um, uh, called a DNS manipulation. And so, um, you know, this is sort of an age old IT related issue. Um, you know, the, the sort of, it's the last bastion of unencrypted traffic really that's coming regularly coming out of our computers. Um, you know, you, whenever you want to resolve uh, www you know, jamescranny.com to an address that you're, that, a, that a machine can, uh, that, that a machine knows how to, how to get to, you have to basically interact with a service that tells you what that translation is. And it's, you know, one of the backbones of the internet, it's called, you know, the domain name service. And for a variety of reasons, those requests, um, are, are typically not only, um, unencrypted, uh, but they go over UDP, uh, which which means it's like very easy to to spoof those or beat those, um, and so it's it's one of the like easiest ways to to interrupt traffic and divert it to a potentially um, nefarious place. Like James, why why is that, and why haven't we solved this problem? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, it's funny. Uh, DNS is one of like the, as you mentioned, it's one of the backbones of the internet. And uh, well, it turns out that it's actually really hard to do well. And so uh, people are, are as, you, as you alluded to earlier, like uh, we don't want to break the internet. And so solving that problem in a way that is um, both uh, safe from a security perspective, but also uh, provides the easy reliability of being able to find google.com without having essentially memorizing this like, um, you know, address book of the world in your head uh, is, is, is something that we actually really haven't solved and isn't trivial. Um, I, there's a really old internet joke that like uh, anytime anything goes down, it's always DNS is the problem. Um, and it's a really, really hard problem to do this, this giant distributed uh, address book in a way that's secure. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's a tough, it's like a really tough um, problem to solve because like actually as cybersecurity professionals who, to your point, Brian, are monitoring the network, DNS is actually a really important tool for us to be able to, for example, block traffic or monitor what's going on. Because if it's unencrypted and we are sort of sitting at the network level, like routing traffic out of an enterprise, for example, we can block requests to websites that we don't want uh, or, or whitelist, you know, um, especially in an OT context where there's a very small amount of traffic that that should be going out of a uh, out of a network. Um, so if we 
all of a sudden try to encrypt that, we're actually completely in the blind about what sort of traffic is going on around the network. Um, so it's it's a really, really tough problem, right, Brian? Sometimes you get these like trade-offs between data observability and and security that are that are hard to resolve. Well, I think it goes back to the uh, the ever long tension between availability and security, right? The most secure box in the world is one unplugged and powered down. <laughs> and if you want something that's always available all the time, that means people need to read it, see it, be able to adjust it, configure it. And because DNS is so um, kind of broken apart in a decentralized way, it's very easy to make changes locally that are even hard to detect at a higher level of the hierarchy, right? And then, of course, there's the real wins, which... Um, if you look at how the internet is organized, people often think of it as kind of this decentralized cloud with a bunch of hub and spokes. It really is. But at the end of the day, there's a very limited number of major devices that are running the backbones of the internet, right? And so if you can get something that trickles down from that level to cause problems, then you can really win as an actor and like, you know, take whole regions of places, you know, countries or continents even, and do a spoof, right? And so if you can redirect all traffic from, instead of, you know, go to jamescrenzy.com, instead of going to IP address 1.2.3.4, you send everybody to 1.2.3.5, which I, evil actor, own, then now I can do all sorts of things. And so um, knowing that that's a problem, we start to look at that through the lens of like OT cybersecurity and that, hey, a lot of new kind of internet of things, technologies that are being used in all these OT platforms, they rely on the internet of things, right? They're using DNS to say, I need to call back to uh, an AWS cloud. So I need to know what IP address my AWS cloud sits at, right? So they're using DNS. Or I need to know where my manufacturer sits so I can call back for updates and do a 24 hour update cycle and ping once a day. And so that opens a lot of concerning vulnerabilities in that let's say I have, you know, a device I've connected to my serial data bus network that does data aggregation and collection for me and is considered an IoT device. It needs to do updates for security reasons, right? But it's always calling back to, you know, shift5.update.com. And so what do I do if that is spoofed? And now my updates are being requested through a resource that I don't own. And so there's like things that you really have to consider where these IT and OT problems overlap that um, we've had a lot of fun on the Shift 5 lab side trying to figure out how to break that kind of stuff. And there's been, you know, 20 years of this happening plus on the IT side for us to kind of sink our teeth into on the OT side. And I think the allure of connecting these operational technology and fleet networks to to some sort of internet or having remote telemetry is just it's too strong for for us to say hey you know you 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 need to keep these enclaves completely disconnected um you know the business case for pulling data off of these assets in 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 real time or near near real time is just so huge to companies' bottom lines being able to maintain their assets better, or operate them more efficiently, and make sure that you've got higher um, you know utilization rates and and that sort of thing. So I mean, what you're really saying, Brian, is like this stuff's hard. You know, whether it's IT or OT, and when you build these telemetry solutions, you really have to like hope that the folks that are doing that have like deep cybersecurity experience because it's really hard to build cybersecurity into things full, f- with first principles. It's even harder to try to go in and patch cybersecurity onto the side of it. I mean, DNS is a perfect example, right? Like we didn't design it with security from first principles. And now we're trying to figure out in 2021, uh, you know, it's probably a 40 year old technology at this point, like Do we put it over TLS? Do we do it through an HTTP session? Like still arguments about that. So it's, it's, um, I think what you're saying is it really underscores the, the need for cybersecurity DNA in whatever the telemetry provider or the data broker is that's connecting onto these, onto these IT or OT networks. Right. So James, we talked about like bad practices and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, as CISA is, uh, is, is going along and, um, you know, determining the the 
the, the, the sort of patterns that emerge across U.S. critical infrastructure, they'll publish sort of this wall of shame of, uh, you know, practices that are, are continuing to, to recur through their experiences. But um, I think it's also important for us to say not only, hey, this is what wrong looks like, but here's what right looks like, or at least here are some things that help you get to a, a better security posture. So, you know, we said having cybersecurity DNA and how you're designing these systems in the abstract is really important. But like, what are some of the concrete things that people, fleet operators, OT asset owners should be like thinking about when they're either like taking their existing systems and, and, and completely replacing them, or they're adding incremental kind of, uh, functionality, uh, to, to these systems. Yeah, well, so I, we think it's like really important to, um, in, I mean, it, it's it's going to be tough. And, and we, we use the DNS example of a, of a of something that's really the design without security in mind, and, and trying to, to add that later. It it's really uh, it's really a hard problem to solve. So like you know you know there's there's like things that you can think about uh, that that are that are truly critical and, and where, you know, we try to come from is, is a, de- a defense in depth approach, right? You're, you're never going to be able to, you know, perfectly secure something by just cutting it off from the internet, right? Like Brian mentioned earlier, the only safe computer one that's, that's uh, unplugged and, and not connected to a, a network cable. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very critical to, to think about layering in security and, and monitoring kind of a, at every single level, um, which, will hopefully, you know, allow you to identify when problems happen. Um, I think it's, it's pretty much a, a belief right now in the security community that, that compromises will happen. And it's all about how you uh, alert, respond, and essentially um, find those problems and, and, and be proactive about, about uh, solving cybersecurity issues inside your networks and, and on, on uh, OT platforms. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the most important like innovations we've seen in cybersecurity is the establishment of you know SOC, you know, security operation centers and hunt teams and red teams, so that you're you're going out there and you're either emulating an adversary and then making sure that you're able to detect that adversary as they're as they're conducting the attack. In the case of sort of like a red team red team engagement, um, or you're actively going and looking for compromise so that you can like reduce the amount of time that the adversary is on your network, figuring out what, what, what to do there. Um, you can't do that without data, right? You, you can't do that without observing what's going on and instrumenting the systems. And, um, you know, but that's hard in some circumstances, right? Especially for OT, if you're talking about a fleet asset or you're talking about, you know, an ICS SCADA system, those are very different from IT enterprise networks. And so the vast majority of cybersecurity products that are out there that are designed for IT networks for enterprises um, with, you know, Windows and Mac and uh, Linux machines and, you know, Cisco network gear, they're just not applicable for something like um, like a, a power plant in a lot of cir- circumstances or certainly not like a ground combat vehicle for, for the military, right, uh, Brian? Yeah, I mean, like, so you'll find that over time, cyber goes way beyond cyber, right? So to go back to CISA for a second, you know, they put out like a year in review for what they did in 2020, and they've done a lot of really cool stuff. I highly recommend going and check it out. They did even things like um, help with election security, right? And so when you're looking at a problem like how do we secure an election, you realize that it's more than just about the software layer and what's running, right? You've got to go deep in things like supply chain. You've got to talk about what's happening on a box. How does that get networked off a box? How do we like secure the data from hop to hop to hop to hop as it goes from you know a voting machine that might be pressing a button and then sending serial data that you're like recording what the vote was, then piping it over an Ethernet network to go some other place. And now you're in the cloud and moving between cloud services to go a few other places. And how do you like make all that happen? And then what happens if there's supply chain issues? What happens if there's inside actors that are going to put in, you know, uh, workarounds or passwords that they know or things like there's a lot you got to check, man. Like there is a lot, right? And so um, the key to so many cybersecurity problems is one of the things we're trying to do at Shift 5, right, which is like 
collect all the data now, <laughs> get it while it's fresh, right from the source before it can even like be manipulated in a lot of ways, and then build your understanding of what's actually going on. So like when we, when it comes to like ground vehicles, we collect all that data off the line and then we build a baseline and say this is what a properly operating ground vehicle looks like, and then we can detect anomalies as they come up, right? And then as we continue to do research towards that end goal of making sure we have a perfectly secure vehicle, we can even do things like say, hey, I need to check beyond what's just the network traffic, but I need to make sure that like I have a gold image firmware loaded on something. Or if somebody's trying to actively attack me, what can I do about it in the middle and do IPS, right? And so um, that is a huge challenge, especially in the OT space where everything's so nascent and very um, very susceptible to any change. You find out how brittle it is, right? Like if you stop a firmware update right in the middle, it's probably going to brick the system unless you have a double EEPROM, right? Where like you have a backup memory of what's running on and we need to be very like aware of those differences in, like the IT and the OT world and exactly how one, a malicious actor would use that to their advantage. <laughs> and two, understanding that like until you red team through some of that stuff, it's just really hard to even realize it's there because that hasn't been something that was built in from the design, right? That's something that's being bolted on and kind of strapped on later uh, just because cyber is a thing now in the world. Yeah, and just even even thinking about the, the bad practices that CISA put out, um, it's interesting to like to actually think through ways of actually addressing them. Like that, they're very they, they exist as bad practices because like the, the there 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 are reasons why they those practices exist right now. Like um, it's critical infrastructure, so managing and patching that software is uh, creates a lot of uh, concern for that organization. What happens if I I decide to update to Windows 10 and uh, I knock over my nuclear power plant like that. I, I can totally understand why there'd be hesitancy to to approach um, this problem. But and, and then same with passwords. It's like, what happens if I forget that, you know, really strong, complex password for my my router that's like sitting in, in some critical node and now I can't I can't access like something super critical. And so um, what, what it's interesting is they they don't really, CISA doesn't really recommend any solutions to these problems. Um, and and it's I, probably because it there's no one solution that, that meets everybody's demand. And so like having like a, a, individuals and teams that are really thinking through these problems for your for everyone's individual networks and platforms and, and infrastructure is, is going to be probably, I, I think it's a really interesting um, space and problem for, for the cybersecurity industry to really start thinking about in depth. I, this is a really good point, James. I mean, I think like there's so many lists of like, you know, proclamations of thou shall do this for cybersecurity. Uh, and when it comes to critical infrastructure and, and some of these, definitely they're technology assets, but things that people don't traditionally think about as technology until you, you know, you can't pump gas or you can't buy meat at the supermarket. And then you realize that actually like everything's technology, um, it, like basically expressing things as a problem that needs to get solved rather than, you know, sort of blanket solutions to things. It's actually a very product oriented approach to, to approaching these, these, these issues, you know, but it does beg the question, you know, what are some of the good practices that you could put in place to try to address some of these issues? And, you know, the, the known passwords and credentials is just really about access management, right? And so some of the things, Brian, that, that you and I and, and and James, you know, have have like spent a lot of time exploring and finding vulnerabilities in and time after time finding weak systems in is just authentication. You know, and I think there are a lot of not to be punny here, but a lot of uh, you know, factors to how how sort of uh, authentication works. But you know, there are there are a bunch of best practices that have emerged around the idea of authenticating users and limiting access. Um, you know, one of them is multi-factor authentication, you know? So the idea that you, you have a multi-factor device or it's a uh, biometrics or, or you have, um, 
you know, some out of band way of verifying that somebody is, is, you know, legitimately trying to authenticate onto the system that can be a huge, um, when implemented properly, that can be a, a huge impediment to folks trying to masquerade with credentials, right? Um, you know, sometimes that can be potentially difficult to do in an operational context, but, uh, it's, it's a great concept nonetheless, right? Like have some other out of band verification that somebody is trying to do something with elevated privilege, right? Well, so uh, bad, bad practices are um, something that I think are going to evolve over time. You know, this is going to be putting out new uh, new bad practices as they find emerging themes over the over the uh, critical infrastructure that they're reviewing. So, you know, I was uh, we were joking earlier that maybe we would put a a pool together to try to predict what the next uh, bad practice is that's going to come on. But uh, Brian, what are what are your predictions? Uh, so I'm predicting user management will pop up somewhere on there, you know, especially with user accounts, especially with admin accounts that are able to adjust things, right? So that means uh, make sure you do limited privilege, like so the principle of least privilege on your accounts, only let them do what they need to do, uh, that people aren't realizing when new accounts are created or they're not deleting new accounts or old accounts when they need to be removed, when someone leaves the company, when someone changes role, because there's so many articles that I read about, you know, this group was able to put ransomware on this machine or to stop this critical industry or process or IT network because they were able to manipulate an account in some way, elevate privilege, and then cause some sort of effect. So I, I think that people cannot keep a good grasp of their accounting, and that'll come up. Yeah, I we've seen this time and time and time again, right? Where you've got you know these user accounts that have all the bells and whistles, and you can fish an employee who's like you know a, a line worker or something, and you have access to the domain controller, and you can just sort of do whatever you want. It's a it's an easy thing that um, can save you a lot of pain, and so I think that's a pretty good guess, James. What's yours? Yeah, so I think uh, having. Uh, outdated or unencrypted and, and unnecessary services and ports open, especially external facing, uh, it seems like a really, um, you know, it, the external facing services are, are usually the hack the hacker's first place of looking for ways into your network. Uh, so removing ones that you don't need, uh, updating, uh, you know, applying best, like using encryption on those services if you can. Um, I, I would imagine that would be a, you know, an easy route for, for different uh, organizations to go to improve uh, in this domain. I'm going to uh, predict that bad practice uh, number three is going to be uh, building systems uh, that are unpatchable. So the idea is that uh, with the safety critical and, uh, you know, uh, sort of critical infrastructure systems, you, you, you're servicing, you know, like a power grid or a transportation infrastructure. Um, and if you design a system so that it can't be patched, uh, and, and, and cause downtime, uh, then you're not going to patch. <laughs> so, um, so it kind of goes along with, with the, the first bad practice that, uh, that CISA put out around, um, you know, using outdated systems that are end of life, because uh, those are sort of de facto unpatchable just because no one's patching them. Um, but but I think there's also some some thinking you've got to do around building architectures for critical infrastructure that allow you to be able to take systems down and maybe put a backup system in place while you're while you're patching, you know, the the, the first one. Um, so I guess we'll maybe we'll we will put that office pool together and and see and see what Jenny Sterling and and team end up putting together. So uh, once this list gets updated, let's plan on uh, reconvening and uh, and discussing the the new bad practices. Uh, maybe we can make a make a ritual out of it. So James, Brian, thank you so much for joining the show. I hope to have you on again really soon. Thanks for having us, Josh. Thank you for listening to this episode of Planes, Trains, and Tanks. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review. To learn more about Shift 5 and our products, visit our website at shift5.io or follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter.